Uh, let us uh, just invite the Lord's presence. Precious Lord, thank you this morning that we can be here together. Thank you, for, for, Lord, for the inspiring children's story that helps us to realize that even with, their, even with forgiveness, Lord, there are scars left on our hearts. We're thankful, Lord, that you heal even scarred hearts, that you are able to remake us and re rebuild us and recreate us, Lord, so that those scars, even though they may be visible, uh, they do not have the impact before you take control of our hearts. Thank you, Lord, for life, for the blessing of having a life in Jesus Christ. And Lord, uh, we pray uh, this morning, especially we think of uh, Bill and Barbara, who lost a good friend. We ask your comforting, uh, loving arms to be around them and comfort them. And for those that have been caring for their loved ones uh, who have been ill, give them strength. Think of Richard. Uh, think of um, Richard Aiken as well, Richard Ramsey, and also John McMahon. Lord, give them uh, strength as they minister to their, uh, to their spouses and uh, give them your blessing. Thank you, Lord, that we can get confidence. Our confidence is in Jesus and that this confidence, Lord, comes from a direct connection with you. So uh, bless our time together, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The title of the sermon this morning is this, Our Confidence. And uh, the Bible, God's word is filled with promises, so many wonderful promises of strength and courage if we place our confidence in Jesus Christ. And it's so easy to become disappointed because we don't see life going the way we want it to. Or, and, and we do not see the big picture that God is working through everything to produce in us a character just like Jesus. And you know, it, it takes time to produce character. It takes situations to produce character. It takes heat to, to, um, to, to melt away the dross in our characters. It takes uh, rough you know, filing and, and chipping away. And uh, there's a painful process in making something beautiful like Jesus in our characters. It's, it's, a, it's a journey. We're on a journey, but the good news is that we're not on this journey by ourselves. We, and this is the beauty of being a Christian. You know, the beauty of being a Christian is to know that Jesus is on the journey with us and that we have a sure destination. He that began a good work in our lives will finish it. As long as the clay doesn't get off the table, you know, as long as we don't, don't jump off the table, he can mold us and make us what he wants us to be. As long as the gold doesn't get out of the fire before it's totally refined, then we, he can finish what he started, right? But he does give us the will. We can choose to jump off the, off the potter's table and the potter can't do any more work with us. But the potter will chase us and he will do everything he can to take us back, put us on the wheel and keep on work, doing his special work. He's just like that. We lose confidence in trusting God and begin to trust in ourselves and what we can accomplish. When we, forget, when we take God out of our lives, then we are thinking about what we can accomplish. And then pride and arrogance takes over, uh, uh, over quickly and we find ourselves forgetting the goodness and the grace of God. Then before we know it, something happens or goes wrong and we cannot, that we cannot control. And what do we start doing then? When we lose confidence in God and we, we start forgetting about his goodness and mercy and then when something bad happens, what do we start doing? We start blaming God. It's all God's fault. You know, there's a story, and I think I shared it here one time, about a gentleman who looked at all the suffering in the world, all the sadness, all the misery, and the, and the starvation, like you know, people starving. And he says, God, why don't you do something about it? But he refrained himself. Do you know why he refrained himself? Because he realized that God may say to him, why aren't you doing something about it? The trust is, or the truth is that nothing apart from God, can save us or make us whole. 
Jesus is the answer and without him at the center of our lives, we will continue to struggle with having confidence in God and we'll continue to struggle with our lives. And so God really truly wants to teach us and wants, wants us to have complete faith, complete confidence in him. Now the word confidence, Bible definition of confidence um, is the, the chief word for in Hebrew is batak, B-A-T-A-C-H. Uh, and it has many different side words, but the, that's the main word. And it's translated in the Hebrew uh, into English as confidence. And uh, it sort of comes from the root of being to be open, to be open, showing thus what originated, the originated the idea of confidence, uh, where there is nothing hidden a person uh, from, a, from a person. We have complete confidence, complete openness, complete connection with God. We ha can have confidence in him. Other words uh, are frequently used for the same root word uh, is trust. So confidence and trust often go together in scripture from the same word in, in different settings. Um, for instance, uh, Psalm 8, 118, 8 and 9, it says, It is better to take refuge in Yahweh or God than to put confidence in princes. That's a often, that's often said, or in 65, Psalm 65, O God, our salvation, thou that art the confidence of all the ends of the earth. Confidence, complete trust. And uh, confidence also words like firmness, boldness, hope, assurance, and of course, trust. So confidence brings the idea of all these words out to us. The Bible teaches the value of confidence. Uh, it's, but it's neither found in gold, in our riches, our material things. Our confidence is not found in man. If we put our confidence in the f arm of flesh, what happens often? We will become disappointed in fact, if you put your trust in, in man, in human beings, God will allow those human beings to do what? Fail. He, he will allow them to fail. And we will become disappointed because he knows that if we put our confidence in, human, in, the human, in humanity, our own, in ourselves, or in others, complete confidence then they're taking God's place. And they will, and they, as human beings, will always fail because we can't, we're not God. We can't take his place. And so we can't put our confidence in gold, our riches, our, our, even our little tiny bit of things. Or we can't put our confidence in man. We cannot, if we put our confidence in self, we will be totally disappointed. So where is there left to put our confidence? Into Jesus, into God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's where he wants to put our, us to learn to put our confidence. There's a story told by Scott Higgins, and it, he entitled it, Living Either Side of the Hill. He tells the story, he says, in November of 2000, my wife and my children and I took a holiday to the Gold Coast. Where's the Gold Coast? It's in Africa, the Gold Coast. And uh, about 600 kilometers or 377 miles north, we were driving up a hill, a big hill, known as Byron Bay. And it was, that Byron Bay was on the other side of that hill. So you had to climb up a hill, and then Byron Bay was on the other side. We were looking forward to it. We had been in the car for a long time. It was hot, and we were eagerly anticipating a break. So up the hill we came, knowing that our break was, about, was, was down the other side. Then we saw it, the most breathtaking view we had ever, we'd ever, you'd ever likely to encounter. At the top of the hill, we got the, the most breathtaking view of a lush green valley stretching away to the deep blue ocean. 
There was a lookout at the top of the hill, so we, we, we stopped and we jumped out of the car and, start, and stood just looking and gazing at the beauty of this beautiful valley and then the be beautiful blue ocean. The children figured that they were at the top of the world and so they got up on the little wall and they were jumping around and, and singing, we're the top of the hill. No, he said, what did they say? They said, we're, yeah, we're, we're on top of the world. We're on top of the world. The little children, we're on top of the world. They were just amazed. They figured this was the top of the world. And they were, they were overjoyed to be at the top of the hill. And in some ways, it really felt like it. It was one of those perfect moments, frozen in time. The children singing and dancing, the, f the wind fresh on the face, the sun shining above us, the road we traveled stretching out behind us, and the road to come winding its way down to the coast ahead of us. We knew who we were. We knew where we had come from. And we knew where we were going. Now he's, he reflects on this and he says, if you think of life as a journey, most of us would like to sit at the top of the world. To have one of those perfect moments where it all comes together and makes sense. Where we can look back at where we've come from and look ahead and know where we're going and to have a sense of what, it's, what is out there waiting for us, to see the detours and the potholes and the danger points that lie out there and to start planning how we'll meet those potholes and those problems and those challenges. Now, do we have the luxury of that very often? To be able to have the view of our life journey and to be able to plan how we're going to deal with the issues that come along? Does God give us that luxury? Very seldom do we get that luxury to do that. So he brings it out. He says, instead of sitting at the top, we spend most of our time traveling on either side of the hill. God sits at the top, and as uh, God sits at the top, has a sense of how it all fits together, but we usually don't get the view like God has. We don't have that view. We get surprised by potholes and detours and danger spots and have to struggle our way through them. Faith or confidence, however, reminds us that God is at the top of the hill and that even in the roughest parts, we can live with trust and confidence in him to guide us through. We need to remember that no matter how rough it gets and how miserable it gets and how awful it gets, that God is at the top, that we can have our confidence in him, that we can trust him even though we can't see him. You know, always we can have a trust because faith is is seeing that which we cannot really see, it takes us there and we can take a hold of it. Now, the Bible's full of stories of those who lived and traveled on either side of the hill. Job struggled with suffering and pain and he wondered why was he afflicted by this horrible pain. If you read in Job chapter 31, 24, it says, if I have made gold my hope or have said to the fine gold thou art my confidence then he could understand why he was in such a mess but he was in a horrible mess and he had no idea why and he was really struggling to figure it out and then he had his three friends who came by to try to give him counsel to show him why he was in the big mess he was in everything seemed to be going wrong for Job and was it because of what Job had done that he was in these problems no, he had an enemy. You know, we've got to remember that we have an enemy. I think when we get into trouble, I think the first person to look at is, first of all, look to God. Because through the Holy Spirit, his job is to reveal to us why we are where we are. Sometimes it's our own decisions, our own bad choices that get us to where we are. Other times, it's the bad choices of other people. We're victims in a horrible conflict between good and evil. 
And sometimes we are victims of situations that we had no control over. Like for instance in Toronto, you know, a girl and her mom at Christmas time were, were going on a shopping trip. But there was also a gang, a war going on in that same area. And some, the gang started shooting at each other. And pretty, all, you know, within a few moments, this, there lies dead and bleeding and dying a young lady, a teenage girl, shot dead because she happened to get hit by a stray bullet in a gang war. You know, th sad things do happen to good people. Good people do get in trouble. So sometimes the situation is completely out of our hands, but it's not out of God's hands. God sees everything, even the little sparrow that falls, God sees, and he loves all. And he, there will be a day when everything will be made right, even the sad things. David learned to have confidence in his God through his trials. In Psalm 118.80, he says, It is better to trust the Lord than to put confidence in man. It's better to trust the Lord than to put confidence in princes. Even high men, even prime ministers or presidents. You know, we're coming up for an election in the United States, and there's a real battle going on, you know, between the two rivaling, you know, presidents, you know, presidents-to-be or wanna-be presidents. You know, each one is putting down the other one. You know, like it seems to be a war of words, you know, not of policies and, you know, you know, follow me because I have this great policy and I'll make this country better. I mean, yes, that may come out, but for the most part, it's throwing pot shots at each other, you know. And is that the way to really run a campaign? I don't know. It seems to be the way that many uh, do. At least in the United States, they're not shooting each other and they're not shooting people. There's not people getting killed in the election process. You know what I'm saying? I mean, in a, many parts of the world where democracy struggles, uh, people die, hundreds of people die, you know, during an election. So praise the Lord, we're not in that situation. So putting our confidence, we have to put our confidence in God. Now strength, confidence is strengthens with evidence and with honesty and transparency. Now in the 1950s, a group of students from Oxford University gathered for their weekly debate, uh, and it was a weekly debate between atheists and Christians. And huddled inside the junior common room at St. Hilda's College uh, at Oxford University, um, there was this meeting and it was chaired by a very famous person from Oxford. His name was C.S. Lewis. Has anyone ever heard of the name C.S. Lewis? Excellent, I mean just an amazing man who became a Christian, very intellectual, very powerful intellectual man uh, and you know, highly respected, but he became a Christian. And uh, there was a young philosophy student named Anthony Flew, F-L-E-W, and he presented a case for atheism at this gathering. His speech was entitled Theology and Falsification. And it, it doesn't sound very exciting, but it became the most widely published philosophical paper in the 20th century. And, and Anthony Flew went on to become one of the leading atheist thinkers of the 20th century. Leading atheist thinker. Got his start right there with C.S. Lewis at Oxford University. It has been said that within the hundreds of years, no mainstream philosopher has developed the kind of systematic, comprehensive, original, and influential exposition of atheism that is to be found in Anthony Flew's 50 years of writing. So he became, he went on to write many, many uh, papers and books and all that about why he was an atheist. He was a born, he was a totally complete, absolute atheist. But in 2004, Flew dropped a bombshell. What do you think the bombshell might have been? He became a believer. He declared he had changed his mind. He had not had a Damascus Road conversion experience. He hadn't become actually a Christian yet, Kenneth. But he, he had not had a personal encounter with God uh, in the way that Paul did. 
He simply believed that the evidence of science and philosophy now pointed to the existence of God. He began on a journey with God. You first, you know, if, you, if you're on a journey with someone, you've, at least you have to acknowledge that they exist, right? If you're going to travel with them, he acknowledged that God existed. That was a massive step for Mr. Flew. When you consider 50 years of writing about atheism and every reason not to believe in God, and all of a sudden he's a believer in God. Wow. It says, he said this. He says, I have followed the argument where it has led me. And it has led me to accept the existence of a self-existent, immutable, Im, uh, immaterial, omnipotent, and omniscient being. That's amazing. But you know, on this journey, he was being honest. And he looked at the evidence, and he had to come to that conclusion honestly. He could have held to his position Many, many do in, with all the evidence of creation, you know, the, there's, what do we call it, creation by, what's it called? Uh, it, people who don't necessarily believe in God in the fullest sense, but they say it's about creation, what's it called? Uh, intelligent design. They recognize that there has to be an intelligent designer behind this. It just can't come into existence on its own. He couldn't, they, could, they cannot believe that a Big Bang brought the beauty and the order of everything in the universe. It just is impossible. You know, they've come to that conclusion. And I believe if anyone is willing to continue on that path, that God will lead them into all truth. If they're honest, God will lead them. Confidence then. So he began to have confidence that there was a God. Now confidence is tested and it's always under attack without any question. Here's a, here's a story, it was a Presbyterian minister and, it, and the story is about, it says, your God, his book is called, Your God is Too Big. Really? Yeah. Your God is too big. I mean, aren't, don't we believe in a really big God who's able to do anything? And he's saying your God is too big. How did he come to that conclusion? Daniel Hans is a Presbyterian minister in the United States. In 1986, he and his wife Beth lost their three-year-old daughter Laura to cancer. Daniel and Beth watched in agony as their little girl faced nine hospitalizations and four separate operations in the last nine months of her life. Their hearts broke as they watched little Laura die, and they struggled to make sense of what had happened. In 1987, Daniel Hans released a book containing some of the sermons he preached through his daughter's battle with cancer and in the period immediately after her death. One of them was entitled, Caution, Your God is Too Big. Hans related how he once surveyed his congregation asking them about their disappointments with God. He asked them to share the things that, had, that they had hoped God would do but that he didn't do. People described times that they had prayed for the life of a newborn child only to see it die. Or hope God would protect his people from violence only to hear of an elderly woman being stabbed to death on her way to church. Or prayed for rain for famine-stricken Africa only to see starvation continue. To these disappointments, Hans now added his own. His own disappointment. He had hoped God would heal his little baby girl. But her condition only grew worse and she died. Hans suggested that disappointments like these are the stuff of life. And that if we read the scripture, we discover that alongside the stories of miracles and amazing feats by God, we hear story after story of disappointment with God, of times God's apparent, of apparent silence and, inactive, and inactivity. He suggests that sometimes we remember only the miracle stories, and so we develop two 
big a view of God. All we see is the miracle stories. Not that we can have too big a view of God's greatness and his power or too big a view of God's love and his grace. No, that's not what we're talking about. But that we can have too big a view of God's will. We think it's God's will that every sadness is going to be corrected at that moment, that every disease is going to be healed, that every bad circumstance is going to be resolved at that moment. God's action in our world is not always to perform the miraculous, but more often than not, it is to walk through our suffering with us. God walks through our suffering with us. Can anyone relate to that? Having gone through suffering and sense God walking through the suffering with you? Lots of people here have had loss. Some a while ago, some not too long ago, and some very recently. Hans suggests that a view of God that is too big is harmful both to the believer and the unbeliever. When our understanding of God ex is exaggerated, we declare that God will do things he does not intend to do, at least not regularly and in all situations. And so that's what he's talking about when he's talking about a God who's too big. God is with us in the journey there's a story about that I, I, I watched on the internet and I, I ran across it. And it was a story, you could watch it. In fact, if you go to Tugboat Goes Under the Bridge. If you just Google Tugboat Goes Under the Bridge, up will come the photographs because someone happened to be on a bridge. And there's a bridge that can open up so that a larger vessel can go through. But he was pulling coal barges down this river and the river was at flood height it was really the rapid the, the, the flood the water was going so fast and uh, he managed I guess to get the the coal barges underneath the bridge but he had to wait until the bridge would go up to get him through well he started the, the way the, the the current was so fast and he couldn't reverse quick enough and, and so he couldn't get his tugboat back. And so all of a sudden he finds himself getting pushed up against the bridge, sideways against the bridge. And someone had a camera and they were taking pictures of this whole thing step by step and you can see it on the internet, on YouTube, and uh, step by step. So all of a sudden you see the tugboat starting to lean as the water starts catching it and pulling it, turning it over. All of a sudden it's on its side. The next thing you know, it's, under, it's disappeared. It's underneath the bridge. And then on the other side, you're waiting. And the next thing is you see this tugboat coming up, popping up, popping up. And the flag is still flying. And there's, and there's, uh, there's uh, diesel like smoke coming out of the smokestack. The motor is still running. The pilot is still at the wheel. This thing is still running and it's still going. It went right under the bridge, completely submersed in water, and all you see is water coming out all the doors and you know, off the deck, the water's coming out, and this guy totally survived. What brought that tugboat up? And I was reading about it. The reason why that tugboat came up was because in the base of the tugboat was, they call it ballast, and there was tons and tons of cement in the bottom of that little tugboat so that it was almost virtually impossible to sink it, well, to, 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 to have it capsize and not pop up again. Because it was, you know what I'm saying? The ballast, once it was up like that, it would go back down. And so that's what saved its life. Saved the, saved the pilot and saved the boat. It didn't sink. And it also had some tanks that made it buoyant. So when it was underwater, it was buoyant and it, had that, and it just righted itself right up. You know, life is like that for us. And I truly believe that Jesus is like that ballast in our life. If we have Jesus firmly in our hearts, 
no matter what is thrown at us, no matter what current that we're facing, because we're running against a current in this world that is designed to destroy and submerge us and to drown us and destroy us. But if we have Jesus as the ballast in our lives, he's like that power, that strength, no matter what is thrown at us. We may go down, we may go under, it may look like we're done. But on the other side of that bridge, we pop up and here we are because Jesus is with us. We're not alone in this battle and in this journey. Problems will come, but Jesus, as our ballast, will see us through. Isn't that exciting? I'm so thankful for that. You know, I, I, I had the privilege of meeting uh, Deborah and, uh, and uh, Shiloh and Elijah uh, just this week. Actually, I met Shiloh last Sunday up at Hilltop, and I met, uh, met Deborah on, on Monday, I believe it was Monday, and I met Elijah. And uh, there was a problem, no, actually it was on Sunday, I met you on Sunday, Sunday afternoon. And we went out to the camp, uh, campground where they were staying, and sleeping under the stars, just on a little blanket, and uh, God, you know, I mean, things had happened, and they were in a situation, and uh, we didn't know how this th solve thing was going to get solved, had no idea whatsoever, but, you know, one of the things we had was confidence in God, and I asked Deborah if she'd like us to pray, and she said yes, and uh, so we prayed, and we prayed that God would resolve this issue however he saw fit. And by God's grace, he did. And it worked out, you know, amazingly. And one of the challenges was it worked out, a door opened for Deborah up north. Her son is, lives up north in Philadelphia. And uh, he opened the door to mom and the kids. And, uh, and to, to come up, come on up, mom, we want you up here. And the boys, uh, uh, Shiloh and Elijah have cousins up there and they're all excited. And, but there was only one problem. There's no money to get up there. How on earth are we going to get up there? Looking at the bus fare, looking at the train fare, uh, looking at the plane fare, the, it was all way up there price-wise. It was way more than, than, than they had the wherewithal at this point in time. And so we were trying to figure out, you know, how could we get the money? We could get 20 bucks from 50 people. We'd have enough money and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but, uh, but at any rate, uh, then, uh, so we were struggling to figure out how we could do it. And I asked Denise, you know, because she's very good on the computer when it comes to finding good fares. And I asked Denise, you know, Deborah and her kids need to get up to Philadelphia. You know, can you check it out? You know, find, see what you can find. So we went on to Southwestern because uh, Deborah from the Homeless Coalition, Homeless uh, Place, she said, Southwest, Southwest, that's the best place to go. Went to Southwest and the fares were really high, you know, hundreds of dollars, you know, ahead. And uh, so Denise was just looking, 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 looking. And then she found an amazing fare. And it was, how much, Denise? $44 each. I said, this has got to be something wrong with this. Like this, what's, $44, that's ridiculous. You know, got all the way to Philadelphia for $44 by plane. And someone had talked about a $49 ticket up, to, up there. And oh, there's no $49 pick, tickets anywhere on the, on, the, on the internet. $44. So for $132, Deborah, Shiloh, and Elijah are on their way on the 13th of uh, September, they're on their way north, getting settled in the school, getting, getting organized. Uh, Deborah has, uh, has job opportunities already coming up. God is good. You know, so, sh so praise the Lord. You know, God takes these situations, this journey with him, and he works out praise and honor. So we'll, let's just give thanks. Let's just have a moment. Precious Lord, thank you so much for, for this wonderful miracle of what you're doing in Deborah's life. Thank you, Lord, for, for Shiloh and for Elijah. Lord, thank you. We pray your special blessing upon them as they start this new, this new leg in their journey that you will continue to reveal your love to them and show them how much you care. We thank you, dear Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You know, as we... Uh, as we look at this, learning to have confidence in God, uh, you know, it's all about a personal friendship with God, a personal journey with Him. And one of the, the texts that, that uh, I can't help but think about, or one of the chapters in the Scripture, we're going to close with, with this chapter, and this is from the book of Isaiah, chapter 58. Because I always remember Revelation chapter 18 where it tells us that before Jesus comes, 
this world is going to be lighted by the glory of God. Then it's, and the glory of God is what? The character of God. The glory of God is his character. And it's God's plan that through these journeys that we're on with Jesus, that he is refining our character and making us more like him. That's his goal. Remember, we were made in his image. Sin came in and messed it all up, and we don't reflect God's image perfectly anymore. However, the plan of salvation is to reproduce God's image, his character, his beauty in his people. That's the bottom line. And the world has to see that God's love is real, in, and, it's, and the, reason it's, the reason that people will believe is because it's real in his people. If it, if, you can't rep if it doesn't reproduce in our lives, all of our words mean nothing. They just fall flat because we'll show it. I want to see it. You know, the old story is I'd rather see a, a, a sermon any day rather than hear a sermon, right? I'd rather see a sermon. So our lives are designed to be sermons on, you know, every one of us, a, a living sermon of his love, his character, his kindness, his mercy, and all the rest of it. So if you go to Isaiah, this is God's plan is uh, it tells us how, uh, how this can happen, how this can happen. Uh, Isaiah chapter 58. And uh, it talks about, it's talking about this fast that they're going to be having, this fast. It says, you know, and they're fasting and they're fasting and all this. And, 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 but he says, look, I'm so sick and tired of your fasting, of all your sacrifices. They just a stench to my nostril. I can't stand it. You know, you don't have that. You know, he's talking to his children because they were so far off. They were, they, were, they were not really, they had no relationship with him. They had no friendship with him, and they were living for their own self. He says in verse 4, he says, Behold, ye fast for strife and debate and, and, and to smite the fist of wickedness, and ye shall not fast as ye do this day to make your voice heard on high. But he says, Is such a fast that I have chosen? A day for a man to afflict his soul? Is it to bow down his head as a bulrush? And in verse 5, Isaiah 58, verse 5, and to, and to spread like sackcloth and ashes under him? Wilt thou call this a fast and an acceptable day to the Lord? Is not this the fast that I've chosen? In verse 6. So this is God's idea of what a fast is. To loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens, to let the oppressed go free. That ye, that ye break every yoke in our own lives and then the lives of others. Help others to break the yokes that, gain, that control them. And then, uh, then he goes on to say in Isaiah chapter 58, uh, in, in verse 7, Is it not to deal thy bread to the hungry that thou bring the poor that are cast out to thy house when thou seest the naked that thou cover him that thou hide not thy face, thine, thine self from thine own flesh, then shall thy light, and look at this light, so as a result of people reaching out and breaking the, 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 the bonds of wickedness, helping people to know Jesus and to give them, get, so they can get connected and put their confidence in him, people become uh, transformed, and this is what happens to those that are doing it it says and this is Isaiah this is Revelation 18 verse 1 as well then shall thy light break forth as the noonday as the morning and thy health shall spring forth speedily and thy righteousness shall go before thee the glory of the Lord shall be thy reward then shalt thou call and the Lord shall answer thou shalt cry and he shall say here I am if thou take away from the midst of thee the yoke, and putting forth the finger, and speaking vanity, if thou wilt draw out thy soul to the hungry, satisfy the afflicted soul, then shall thy light rise in obscurity, and thy darkness be as the noonday. If you want to have, if this is what, this is God's people are going to be doing tangible things, blessing others, being part of the renewing of other people's lives, transforming other, helping others to be transformed by his love. The Lord shall guide thee continually and satisfy thy soul in drought and make fat thy bones. Thou shalt be like a watered garden, 
like a spring of water whose waters fail not. This is an amazing prophecy. This is, I believe, is what God wants for Seventh-day Adventist Church and all Christians in the last days. This is what it's all about. This is Isaiah 58. This is powerful. And then it talks about, in verse 13, if thou wilt turn thy foot from the, what? From the Sabbath. From doing thy own pleasure on my, on my holy day. And call the Sabbath a delight. And the holy of the Lord honorable. And thou shalt honor him. Not doing thy own ways. Nor finding thine own pleasure. Nor speaking thine own words. Then the promise. Then shalt thou delight thyself in the Lord. And I will cause thee to ride upon the high places of the earth. And feed thee with the heritage of Jacob. The father. Thy father. For the mouth of the Lord is spoken. If you want to have new health, new strength, new vigor, this is the formula. And, it, and now listen to this. This is from uh, a manuscript releases, uh, 116.1902. It says this. All around us are afflicted souls. Let us search out those, if, those suffering ones and speak a word in season to comfort their hearts. Here and there and everywhere we shall find them. Let us ever be channels through which may flow to them refreshing waters of compassion. To those who minister to the necessities of the hungry and afflicted, the promise is, then shall thy light rise in obscurity. God will have a people on this earth that are really caring, really reaching out, really loving and finding people to minister to that need them. And they're going to be busy and active in this work. Uh, and that's why the whole world will be lightened by the glory. It's the character of Christ being reproduced in a people. Many are in obscurity. They have lost their bearings. They, they know not what course to pursue. Let the perplexed ones search out others who, in, who are in perplexity. And speak to them words of hope and encouragement. When they begin to do their, this work, the light of heaven will reveal to them the path that they should follow. By their words of consolation to the afflicted, they themselves will be consoled. So as we, as we, con, as we encourage others, we will be consoled. As we bless others, we will be blessed. By helping others, they themselves will be helped out of their difficulties Joy takes the place of sadness and gloom. The heart filled with the Spirit of God flows with warmth towards every fellow being. How many? Every fellow being. Every such a one no longer, okay, every such and one is no longer in darkness for his darkness is as the noonday. Praise the Lord. This is what God wants to do. And he's calling us all to be part of that. You know, I was thinking about it, uh, Becky. I was thinking about, wouldn't it be neat if when we give food out at the pantry, we give them a little bit extra food and we say, why don't you find someone that you know that needs some bread, needs a little something, you know? We give them a little something to give to someone else. Now, it could be from their own stuff, but we could, do, we could encourage them to give because if you want to receive, you need to learn to be, to be a giving person. If we hold it for ourselves, it will destroy us. If we give it, it will it'll, it'll, it'll be like a, a new light shining. So find opportunities to be a blessing to others. Do not be afraid of giving money if as long as the money, or, you know, so whatever it is, I'm not saying give money to people indiscriminately. I don't think that's a good idea. But uh, maybe investing or helping or whatever it is, uh, and, and you will find that the day will come when uh, you will be healed of your problems and your afflictions, and you will see others come to know and see the living Jesus as well, however God shows that to you. And so we are learning to put our confidence not in the Lord. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put our confidence in princes. All nations surrounding me, but in my name, the Lord, uh, it says, he says, and it, it's closing here from, uh, this is Psalm, uh, Psalm uh, 118. And the last, uh, the last verse says this. This was the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. And then in verse 29, 
Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, and his mercy endureth forever. You may not be at the top of the hill all the time. It may be that you're, you're down in the valley many times, but remember that God is at the top of the hill, and if you let him be in the top of your life, if you seek first the kingdom of heaven and his righteousness, everything else will be added to you. Let us pray. Precious Lord, we're thankful that you are with us in the valleys. You are with us in the troubles. You are with us at the top as well. And we love being at the top. But Lord, many times we find ourselves in the valleys. But we're thankful, Lord, that in those dark times and difficult times, we have confidence. Our confidence is in you and that you will see us through, and that one day we will be arriving at that shore, that glorious shore, and that you will be with us for eternity. Help us to be willing to let you do what you have to do in our lives so that we can be refined and that we can reflect your character and prepare others for your kingdom as well. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.